Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Father, we ask that as we go into your word, that you open our hearts to receive from you today the message which you have for us. Amen. Amen. The light within you. Hallelujah. The topic of the message, today's message, is the light within you. Hallelujah. Let's talk about that light within. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, from verse 8, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, it reads thus, it says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Hallelujah. Verse 10, carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Verse 12, it is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. Verse 13, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. Verse 14, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Hallelujah. So we're talking about the light from within. There is a light inside of every believer, and that light is tied to the eternal word of God, Jesus Christ. But before we get into the light, I want to talk about darkness. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, in the lives of believers, we have these contrasting you know, concepts of light and darkness. And I want to begin at the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, from verses 1 through 3, you know, at the very beginning, God situates the goodness of light. See, Genesis 1, 1 reads this, thus, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light, saw the light, that it was good. And then God divided the light from the darkness. Now, we have to pay attention here because, you know, darkness cannot abide light. When light comes, darkness disappears. So what is this verse saying that God divided the light from the darkness? Well, the answer is down in verse 14. Then God said, let there be lights, this time plural, in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let there be for signs, let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, verse 15. And let there be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light unto the earth. And it was so. Verse 16, then God made two great lights the greater light to rule the day, the lesser night, light to rule the night. So the separation of light and darkness that God did was in terms of the day and night. See, night is dark, and day is light. It made two lights to govern both seasons, you know, the sun and the moon. And he threw some stars in, in between. Now, so what are we talking about here? In at the beginning of creation, God equates light with life. Light equals light, life. And darkness equals spiritual blindness. You know, and I'm talking about this metaphorically because we see that in the life of a believer, when the light of God has come to illuminate the path, the way to follow, darkness even though cannot abide light, exists still because it's not completely wiped out. There are seasons of darkness and there is something called a veil, 
we shall go into that as we dip further into this message. Amen? Hallelujah. There is a light within you, and there is a darkness out there. Let's focus now on the light, the true light of God. Amen? John chapter 1, from verses 4 through 12, talks about this light, you know, in depth. And I read from the New King James. In him, in who? In Jesus was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. Six, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He's talking about John the Baptist. This man came for a witness to bear the witness of the light that all through him might believe. And he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Hallelujah. It's talking about Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Now, verse 10, he says, he was in the world, he, Jesus, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him, and he came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Hallelujah. So there's a connection between the light of God the, the, and the Lamb of God and the Messiah who comes to save this world. He brings a light and that light is a bequeath to all believers. And that is the light that is within you. Amen. Hallelujah. You say you're speaking in metaphors today, Pastor. Let's, let's look at this veil, you know. Hallelujah. The light and the veil. There is a light that chases away all darkness, but there is a veil that blocks the light from being seen. Hallelujah. And I want to talk about this. He that commanded the light of this world to shine out of darkness was himself long a light shining in the darkness. There was a, a veil upon this light. Second Corinthians Chapter 3, verses 12 to 16, again in the New King James, says this. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Verse 13, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded, for until this day, the same veil remains in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away. Watch this. The veil is taken away only in Christ. Verse 16. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the book of Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, the Jews who had the light of the Old Testament, yet comprehended not Christ in it, as there was a veil upon Moses' face, so there was one upon the people's heart. In the darkness of the types and shadows, the light shone, but such as the darkness of their understandings, they could not see it. It was therefore requisite that Christ should come both to rectify the error of the Gentile world, us, and to improve the truths of the Jewish church. So the eternal word of God, the logos, the written word, the eternal word of God shines in at the darkness of our natural conscience. You see, in Romans chapter 1, verses 9, 19 through 20, it says, because what may be known of this world is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, what is this saying? That the veil has, uh, the veil stands in the way 
of the light. They are people upon whom the light has been shone, but because there is a veil, a veil standing between them and the light, they cannot see the light. They cannot perceive the truth. So there is a spiritual blindness that occurs that is called the veil that sits upon the hearts of men that makes it impossible for them to see God. And those of us who have seen the light, who live in the light, when we experience the opposition of the veil, we have to look at the light within us to illuminate our path. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go further and talk more about this. You know, light reveals. Hallelujah. Light reveals. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, but he answered, Jesus answered, it is written, when Satan was tempting him in the wilderness, he answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He illuminated, he elevated the word of God to the utmost. The eternal word of God is how you overcome the veil because light reveals. See, reasonable creatures have their light from him, from Jesus. That life, which is the light of man, comes from Jesus Christ. Life in man is something greater and nobler than in other creatures. It is rational and it's not merely an animal instinct. But when man become, became a living soul from the breath of God, his life is light. And this light distinguishes him above beasts of the fields that perish. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And it is the eternal word that lit this candle. The light of reason, as well as the life of sense, derives from Jesus and depends on Jesus. This proves that Jesus is fit to undertake our salvation. For life and light, spiritual and eternal life and light, are the two great things that the fallen man needs the most. See, when we are down and out, when we are, you know, dispossessed and we are under the power of death and darkness, the only thing that can bring us through is the light of God. You know, from whom may we better expect the light of divine revelation than from him who gave us the light of human reason. And if when God gave us natural life, that life was in his son, how readily should we receive the gospel record that he has given us eternal life and that that life too is in his son? Oh, hallelujah. Now, what I'm saying to you here is that light reveals darkness. It reveals all of the secrets. It reveals all of the trappings, all of the snares. It lights you know, up the way for us to follow. Christ is our example. He's our Lord and personal Savior, and he is the light of the world that guides us to the knowledge of truth and grace. Only the light of Christ can help us overcome all of the uh, treachery of the enemy and our wily adversary who is prowling this earth back and forth, seeking who he may devour. Amen. Jesus is the true light. Hallelujah. Now, what do we do with this light? What do we do with this light? In Matthew chapter 5, in the very next chapter, Jesus is talking to his uh, disciples. And in verse 14, he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Verse 16, here it is. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So we are called to lead an exemplary life that that light that is within us will be palpable and shining so that it will attract men as we lift up the glory of our father 
men will be lifted up as they come, young and old, women, children, they all will be lifted up because our light is shining forth. Hallelujah. Let's talk a little more about shining. You know, shining involves sharing. And what is this sharing? In practical terms, we are called to evangelism. You see, Luke 19, uh, uh, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said this, you know, when he was at the house of Zacchaeus, you know, who, who climbed up the sycamore tree. And Jesus said to Zacchaeus, he says, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Verse 10, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the gospel in a sentence, that Jesus has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Hallelujah. And to tie this back to the old prophet, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, the prophet Hosea said this, as led by the Spirit of the Lord, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. So as it was then, now, so it is now, I desire mercy more than sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offering. See, in our charge to reach out to the lost, we are told to reach out with mercy. We are told to reach out to those who are lost and to rebuke gently, not with judgment. You know, so it, is, it falls to our lot to take this light of ours and not hide it under a bushel, but to place it as a beacon on a hill so that it would attract people and draw people to Christ. And between that and the work of the Holy Spirit, they shall be touched. Hallelujah. Now let's talk about the lamp. See, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 says this. The light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thine whole body shall be full of light. Now this is almost a cryptic message, but I want to deconstruct it because it's so important for us. Inside of the light, see, with the eye, the singleness of eyes, of sight, with the eyes, we set our ends before us, our goals. We mark, you know, the marks that we shoot at, the places that we go to. In everything we, we do, there is one thing or another that we have in our eye, in our vision, in our sight. Now, if our eye be single, here is, the, here is the breakdown of that cryptic message. If our eye be single, meaning if we aim honestly and we fix the right ends, we set the right goals and we move towards them. And if we aim purely and only at the glory of God, meaning everything we do brings glory to our God. If we seek his honor and favor and direct all our entirety to him, direct all entirely to him, then our eye is single and our body is full of light. You see, Paul was so when he said to me, uh, Paul was so when he said to me to leave is Christ. And if we be right here, the whole body will be full of light. All the actions will be regular and gracious, pleasing to God, comfortable to ourselves. But here is the opposite. If this eye be evil and not single, if instead of aiming only at the glory of God and our acceptance with him, we look aside at the applause of men, and while we profess to honor God, we contrive to honor ourselves and we seek our own things under the color of seeking the things of God, then our eye is evil and our body is full of darkness. So the singularity of our eye has to do with the condition of our heart set up on bringing glory to God. If our eye be single, singularly focused on bringing glory to God, then our body is full of light. Hallelujah. So you have the light inside of you. You are supposed to be a satellite reflecting the, the light of God onto the world, projecting, if you will, the glory of God onto the world, not seeking that glory for yourself. 
And there are many who have fallen in that path of seeking the glory for themselves. The lamp of God, the light of God is meant to attract others to this kingdom. Hallelujah. And I want to talk about the kingdom before we wrap up. See, there is a kingdom. We have a king, the king of all kings. And I want to read from Luke chapter 17 now, verses 20 and 21 as we close. The king, coming kingdom. See, now when he was asked, Jesus, by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God, when would the kingdom of God come? He answered them saying, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Verse 21, nor will they say, oh, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. We are back to this concept of the light again within you. See, there are three popular interpretations of Jesus's word in Luke 17, 21, that the kingdom of God is within you or in your midst or among you. Number one, that the kingdom of God is essentially inward within a man's heart. Number two, that the kingdom is within your reach if you make the right choices. And number three, that the kingdom of God is in your midst in the person and presence of Jesus Christ. Now, my favorite of these three interpretations is the third. Uh, Jesus is inaugurating the kingdom as he changed the hearts of men one at a time. You see, so this light that is within you is supposed to lead you to a changed person, a metamorphosis. So you begin to think and reason and thirst and hunger after the righteousness of God so that it turns you into this person who is reflecting the goodness of God and reaching out to enrich and extend the kingdom of God, the light of God to others in your life. Oh, hallelujah. It seems when you look deeply enough that we are always coming to the same point. We're always speaking to the same purpose and the same message. You know, I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity now to make Jesus your life, uh, your Lord and personal Savior. Because none of this is true. None of this promise of the light is true unless you are a child of God. And Romans chapter 10, verse 9 of the Living Bible tells us how to do this. So for if you tell others with your own mouth that Jesus is your Lord and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So whether you're watching this broadcast now in real time, or whether you're watching this much later at a different time, this promise endures. The only thing that you need to do is be serious in your heart, be serious about repenting, be serious about this prayer, and the gift endures and your blessing is assured. So pray with me now, dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and life today. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the kingdom of God. You now have a light of God living inside of you. Hallelujah. Now the adversary of our souls will come and dispute that. So I want to leave you with three quick instructions on what to do. See, the enemy will come and say, oh, you see, you prayed that prayer. You're no different. You have the same challenges. You have the same disappointments. He will come at you at different times to dissuade you. But he had three things to do to prevent that. One, talk to God every day. What do you, what do you talk to him about? You talk to him about your cares, your fears, anything that concerns you, Christians call that prayer. You talk to God every day. You know, he designed you to fellowship with him. He, he appreciates you coming to him and telling him about your day, your goals, your, your, your concerns. Everything and everything is welcome in prayer. Number two, read the Bible every day. God talks to you through his word. His desire to speak that eternal word of God that bears his light, that bears witness of his truth is found in his word. 
Hallelujah. And as you read the Bible, God will begin, the Holy Spirit will begin to have this communion with you and the fellowship will cause you to be an answer to prayers, to be the one that will speak the word of truth and speak the oracles of the living God to all of those who have been assigned to you. Number three, join a Bible-believing church. I welcome you to Grace Gate Church, where we preach the unadulterated word of God. I welcome you to any Bible-believing church where you will grow and mature into the purpose of God's calling in your life. Friends, it has been my pleasure to share the word of God with you today, that there is a light within all of us, and that light is the light of God, the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for your time, and I want to say a quick prayer now. Hallelujah. Glory to God.